This summer feels like a page torn from the book of Revelation. The planet's alarm bells ringing all at once. Above the idyllic palm trees and ocean views of Hawaii, thick plumes of smoke, wildfires sparked by dry conditions, fanned by powerful winds, spreading quickly and burning indiscriminately across two of the archipelago's islands. Thousands of people have been evacuated, homes and livelihoods destroyed, tourist holidays cancelled and almost a week since they began, the wildfires on the island of Rhodes rage on. Three days of heavy rain brought severe flooding in Austria. In neighboring Slovenia, cleanup operations are proving a mammoth task. After the worst flooding on record, in which six people died. Record level temperatures continue to bake the country from California to the southeast. Phoenix fuming with 21 straight days with at least 110 degree temperatures. And Miami hitting a record 40 consecutive days of triple digit heat index. We're in a fight of our lives. We're in a fight for the lives, the future of humanity, particularly for our children to have a life worth living all over the world. Welcome to Facing Future. This year we've seen the hottest week ever recorded. Triple digit heat afflicts every continent. Ocean temperatures are higher than ever recorded. Unprecedented hailstorms, floods, and tornadoes. Fire in Canada, Siberia, Kazakhstan, Italy, Greece, Tunisia. The list goes on and on. And all this while the El Nino is just beginning to make its mark. With me today are Peter Carter, the director of the Climate Emergency Institute and co-author of Unprecedented Crime, Climate Science Denial and Game Changers for Survival. Paul Beckwith is a climate scientist with degrees in engineering and physics. He's taught climatology, meteorology, and oceanography at the University of Ottawa and Carleton University. Welcome to you both. Hello. The industrialized countries of the world are responsible for our feverish planet and are now feeling the heat as never before. Will this finally break our addiction to fossil fuels and prompt the restoration of nature's critical systems? The evidence is all around us. What does the rest of this decade portend? Paul, what do you think? Well, it's it's um, hard to know where to begin because uh, you've mentioned a whole... Um, a whole litany of uh, you know extreme weather events, um, the fires, the heat. Lots of places around the world are hitting, having it simultaneously, especially in the northern hemisphere. But also, you know, there's massive heat in the southern hemisphere. There's massive heat at the poles in the Arctic, the the Antarctic, Antarctic sea ice, for example. Which our summer in the northern hemisphere, it's our winter. The ice is supposed to be forming. And uh, it's way below, it's like basically one in 7.5 billion chance of this happening by chance, the lack of sea ice growth in Antarctica. So the entire planet is being affected. Um, the extreme weather events are greatly accelerating. You know, the climate system seems to have completely broken down. Uh, many people are dying in these heat waves. Um, and I think deaths are greatly underreported. There's mm -hmm. anecdotal evidence, for example, look at Texas, we're passing wet bulb temperatures in some regions, although generally it's very dry. The heat is high enough that it's um, actually affecting with the chemistry of the body, the skin, molecules are being broken down, proteins are being denaturized, and the heat is just, uh, it's unbearable for people and for animals. I mean, we talk about mostly about impacts on humans, but the impacts on the plants and animals is also very extreme. And one of the biggest near-term threats is global crop failures. And I think, yes. uh, you know, we're heading to that, certainly within this decade where we're going to get massive food spikes and, uh, you know, famines in many countries, um, things like that. So we're, we're really, everything is hitting the fan, if you like. You know, I like to say that we're all in the climate casino, where if we're unlucky, then we get our city flooded out, or we have a massive heat wave drought. 
or catastrophic winds, derechos or tornadoes or tropical storms, hurricanes, etc. So, so all of these things are, are happening. And, you know, it's generally far worse than the mainstream climate science community has expected. I mean, scientists are getting very scared. And we just have next to nothing in terms of political action that will actually lower greenhouse gas levels. Yeah, Although so- in Europe, they did recently pass um, a climate restoration uh, law, a nature restoration law, just a few days ago, um, which would it, it, pathetically, I suppose, um, you know, recover 20 percent of the land and sea by yeah. 2030 and then the rest of it by 2050, that sort of thing. But, it, you know, there are there and there are a lot of lawsuits that are happening as well. Yeah, definitely things are happening. But the the climate system, the weather patterns, the, the climate system has essentially broken down and it's going to get a lot worse in the next few years because the El Nino, some people are saying all of this turmoil right now is because of the yes. El Nino, but that's not true. The El Nino, it, we have that to look forward to uh, because it's just um, ramped up and it's not really the reason why we're getting all of these events right now. And the climate system is is pretty much breaking in front of our eyes in real time as we see. And the reason is the continued record emissions of, of fossil fuels. And I think uh, Peter can speak to that uh, better than I can, I think. Yeah. Um, the problem is, and it's a problem for um, all of our children in the world today, and it's a problem for all future generations. And certainly, I, I agree, Dale, that we need to focus very definitely on, on the next decade. We need to focus on now, what we do now. Um, what is happening now, however, is uh, everything um, uh, is being done in, uh, in the wrong way. As you know, I follow the what I call the climate indicators. Um, the single most mm-hmm. crucial climate indicator is what James Hansen talks about, which is the energy imbalance. So the energy imbalance has shot up. It's uh, doubled in just the past 15 years. And uh, the scientists are uh, more than a little alarmed about that. Unfortunately, in their alarm, they're not talking about it very much. Um, that, that's the worst metric uh, that we've ever had. So um, it's more than a little worrying. So what's being done in response, right? So we have these unprecedented extreme events, unprecedented heat waves. The heat wave in the United States is going to expand even further. The uh, heat wave in the United States has already lasted nearly six weeks. So this is going to be a world record for the length of a very severe heat wave. Now, of course, we've been told about this for decades by the IPCC. Nothing has been more certain than if we allow global warming emissions to continue. Obviously, heat waves are going to be more frequent, they're going to be more intense, but they're also going to last longer. And the lasting longer, of course, makes a huge difference to uh, people's tolerance and health and whether people die or not. The other thing is whether the heat continues in the nighttime, and it is now. In uh, all of the countries, particularly the Northern Hemisphere, that are getting these unprecedented heat waves, they're getting sustained high heat in the nighttime. And that really is, is when people die with the heat. The governments are doing, continuing to do worse than nothing. It's more than a crime. They are continue to push, encourage, permit more fossil fuel extraction, more fossil fuel combustion. And they continue to subsidize the fossil fuel industry in an amount of money that is as high as ever. We are absolutely not going to see anything change unless somebody can compel the governments to stop subsidizing the fossil fuel industry. It's absolutely absurd. We have this situation where we have this marvelous, I mean, fantastic, great renewable energy technology. It's getting better and better all the time. It's getting more and more cost effective all the time. If the governments would stop subsidizing the fossil fuel industries, the market would largely take care of things. Uh, The money would flow out of the fossil fuel industry and into renewables. There is a tremendous amount of money going into the fossil fuel industry right now, all over the world. We have a terrible stellar example in Canada, 
We're building a massive LNG plant up in the uh, northwest coast of British Columbia because we're fracking up in the northwest coast of British Columbia natural gas in a vast area. It is a huge area. And uh, the fracking maps are just, I mean, they're just awful. They're like the ones that you see in, in the States. What is the rest of this decade going to look like if we're continuing in this pathway? Yeah, we can't do anything that really is going to make any difference to the next decade, right? Um, uh, we, we are, as people say, we're locked in. Um, uh, we're burnt in to uh, a temperature increase in this next decade. We're locked into the situation where these extreme events will continue to increase. And it's not helpful um, uh, to uh, sort of minimize, you know, or sort of, you know, shrug off how bad it's going to be. It is going to be more terrible, more awful. And uh, yes, of course, it's going to affect more so the billions of vulnerable people who are living uh, in the tropics and the subtropics. But the Northern Hemisphere is getting thrashed. And, and this year is not new. This is a trend, okay? Um, uh, we had the same situation last year in the Northern Hemisphere, same situation the year before in the Northern Hemisphere, so um, ho hopefully um, our leaders are getting the message that, no, the Northern Hemisphere is not going to ride out climate change, not at all. It's going to continue to suffer um, unprecedented extreme events from climate change. So what we do now, though, if we get our emissions stopped immediately, which we have to do, we have to do that. We have to stop burning fossil fuels and get our emissions down right away. IPCC says this, chair of the IPCC, or Sen Lee, has said it three years in a row. Nobody's repeating it. This was not publicized in the media at all, although he said it three times at three cocks. Uh, none of the scientists that I'm aware of have repeated this. The crucial issue is to put fossil fuel emissions into decline right away. If we were able to stop using fossil fuels this minute, what would happen to the climate? What would happen to the heat? What would happen to the CO2? The IPCC, I think, in its last assessment was very helpful about that. For the first time, they told us what would happen if we got serious and said, OK, we're going to apply policies now. We're going to put emissions into decline. They said that we would not see a change in temperature in under 20 years. So the temperature would continue to slowly rise, right? And then it would level off in about 20 years. So there's an idea going around uh, amongst the science community that if we stop emissions, okay, then temperatures don't change. That's a lovely idea that the models will give you. But of course, we're living in the real world. The real world is getting really hard to live in. So that's misleading too. They say the models tell us that if we stop emissions immediately, temperature doesn't change, it doesn't go any higher. It's terribly misleading, and the IPCC obviously um, uh, took that head on and made it clear that's not the situation. There's a momentum in the climate system. So as Peter's saying, we've got these temperature rises locked in. One of the big things that is different now, as opposed to some of the previous years, is the amount of heat in the ocean and it's stored, when it's stored in the ocean, it's not, all, it's not just at the surface, it's down below. So what we're seeing is record temperatures in the North Atlantic, for example, off UK. Temperature is five or six degrees warmer than normal. Temperature is much warmer in the ocean going right up into the Arctic. Temperatures in the Southern Ocean being much, much higher, which is the root cause for the lack of sea ice regrowth in Antarctica. And the El Nino, of course, uh, the temperature that's stored deep in the Western Pacific is then sloshing across the ocean, the Pacific, in what's called the Kelvin Wave, where it's basically coming up to the surface off South America, which is, you know, what happens in El Nino's. And then that heat is all released to the, to the atmosphere. We're also cutting back uh, aerosols in shipping. Uh, so we're having less sulfur creating low level clouds, et cetera, in the oceans. So the oceans are exposed to more and more solar radiation, which is greatly heating the surface, as well as the upwelling of warmer water. So 
there is uh, this lag in the climate system. And I think James Hansen is one of the people that puts it best, the idea of global warming in the pipeline, so to speak. What we see ahead of us, it's a metaphor he uses in the pipeline. It's nothing to do with pipelines. It's the idea that we've got this heat baked in. And what we have to look forward to since 2010, his data has convinced him that rather than rising 0.18 degrees Celsius per decade, since 2010, the global average temperature is rising 50 to 100% higher than that. So 50% higher would be 0.27 degrees Celsius per decade to 100% higher would be 0.36 Celsius per decade. So, you know, when Peter's talking about what we have in store for, say, the next two, two decades out, 20 years, we're talking not about a small rise in temperature. We're talking about a rise in temperature of between, multiply 0.27 by 2, you get 0.54, multiply 0.36 by 2 for two decades, that's 0.72. So we're looking at about a 0.5 to 0.7 degree Celsius rise in global average temperature over the next uh, two decades. Is that no absolutely way. baked in, Paul? Is that something that you think well, we are going to go to? This is what Hansen's paper is indicating. So if we zero fossil fuel emissions now, there's no way that we're going to keep that down to zero rise. We might cut the half a degree to 0.7 degrees a bit. Maybe instead of 0.7, it would be 0.3 or something. But we're still looking at huge rise in global average temperature. And of course, we all know the problem is we know the problem that we have right now at less than 1.5 Celsius, right? The weather extremes around the world have, have greatly accelerated and the cost to people is enormous. The cost to, you know, how long is it going to be before like a town, for example, or a city is devastated by a climate event and there's just no money to rebuild it? There's no money. I mean, people are losing their insurance in Florida and California and places the insurance companies are trying to survive and they won't if they keep having these huge payouts for these disasters. So we've been heading to this state for a long time, for decades and decades. Scientists have given warnings, uh, but politicians have ignored them. Governments have ignored them. Fossil fuel subsidies have even increased since COVID. They were much higher than they were Just even amazing. pre-COVID. We had an opportunity then. I mean, we've got a lot of... Um, idiots in, in charge of, of policy, basically. And we haven't addressed the, the climate issue and we're suffering enormous consequences now. So, you know, it's, it's fantasy to expect that things won't get a lot worse before they get better. And it's also fantasy to expect they'll get better unless we take the action that Peter speaks of, basically slashing fossil fuel emissions. And also, Governments are starting to look more at things like solar radiation management, you know, trying to block some of the sunlight or carbon dioxide removal. Well, the those CO2 things, removal, you know, in, in terms of those machines is like, oh, we take 100 tons out or something. It's, it's yeah, flat, or even yeah, a thousand it, tons. It's so irrelevant. You I mean, know? Nothing, but the yeah, restoration we, we, of we mangroves and, and natural systems, nature has pulled down carbon in the past, yeah. lots of carbon. It can yeah. do that. We know that, but it's going to take, of course, time to do that. Whether humanity has a chance for nature to, to take our junk out of the air or not is a, is a big question. The sea level rise may very well take out our major cities. Um, I, predictions are flying all over the place, but even Michael Mann, who has put out some conservative ideas, is saying it's going to be meters, not feet. And sooner than we think, if Greenland melts, it did have a point where 6 billion tons melted in a day of ice from Greenland, July 15, 16, 17. This could go rapidly, couldn't it? There could be like an, an amazing acceleration as, as the feedback loops start to kick in and we start to see an amplification. The climate system, I think, can best be described as it's in a explosive situation right now. And there are two items which are absolutely nightmarish that Paul and I and many other people feared long, long, long ago. One is the methane, right? We are now in a situation in which we have methane feedback. We have methane emissions coming out in large amounts from all the world's wetlands. This is one thing that the scientists have all agreed on. They're alarmed and they're agreed on it. And that can only get worse because it's a feedback and we can't get our temperature going down 
by slashing our emissions. And I want to say that none of the other things are going to work unless we slash emissions, right? So talking about removing carbon dioxide is absolutely crucial. We should have been developing the capacity decades ago, right? Cooling the earth to some degree we may be forced to do, but it's all futile if we don't stop extracting and us burning more and more and more fossil fuels. And the world economy is going quite the opposite way. As I say, vast mm -hmm. new developments for fossil fuel extraction are occurring all around the planet. And um, uh, that's the biggest crime that you could ever imagine. It is the, the so-called economic development is not giving our children a chance for the future. Now, I want to say something that the IPCC said, which was crucially important. They said on three different occasions that we now have to secure a livable future. Now, when the IPCC conservative body says something like that, my ears go up. On another occasion, they actually said we might secure a livable future if we put our emissions into decline rapidly mm -hmm. and immediately. So I, I think the IPCC has done us a great service. It's not been repeated enough. We're in a fight of our lives. We're in a fight for the lives of the future of humanity, particularly for our children to have a life worth living all over the world. And we all have to be in this fight. The uh, team that you have, Dale, doing a wonderful job, um, uh, Paul and our little team, uh, you know, we try and get the truth out there all the time. Everybody has to get involved in this, right? I mean, absolutely everybody. And I'm not seeing a sign of that yet. So the problem really is we are not being told or understanding how dire this emergency situation is. And it's getting worse every, every year. And the IPCC said the other thing, and I want to mention this, then I'll hand back to Paul, uh, which is very important. They said every single increment, every tiny increase in global warming that we allow is going to increase to a very large extent all of these severe weather events. Well, the weather events are now affecting, as you said, Peter, the, the Northern Hemisphere the United States, Europe are really, really feeling it. In last summer, 60,000 people died or more in Europe. Probably it's underreported. We've breezed by, oh, Bangladesh, people die. Oh, you know, Africa, people. We seem to like be immune to the suffering of our brothers in the South and sisters. But now that it's really hitting us, the people who make the problem, this is where it seems to get interesting. This is where, you know, if Washington, D.C. is so hot that the power system goes down and the air conditioning doesn't work. What does it take you know, for the people who are in powers and can do things to be hit by this themselves? Um, I don't think they're going to do anything until the oneness. public forces them to. Well, I think uh, uh, right, sure. what, or, or what may happen is um, the Texas power grid for electricity is notoriously bad. I mean, we've seen major failures um, re recently. So if we have uh, one of these ma major failures, for example, during during the heat wave, uh, because the rivers get too warm for nuclear power plants to operate, the coal plants, there's supply problems with getting uh, materials to the power plants, or the grid, the, the uh, transmission line grid just fails, and we go into a heat wave for, you know, half a week or a week in Texas, we're going to have mass um, mortality. We're going to have uh, huge numbers of people dying of heat, heat exhaustion, heat stroke, uh, elderly, young people, major cities we all know are much, much warmer because of the heat island effect than surrounding rural areas. And we're at these limits. I mean, we're at the limits of human tolerance. We're reaching temperatures of 50 degrees. In fact, there's reports of people that are taking hikes in, in national parks and just uh, disappearing and their bodies found later. There's cases of people stepping outside in Phoenix, which has maintained unbelievable temperatures for a month or so, getting burned on the pavement, falling over. You put your hand on the pavement to break your fall and you get third degree burns on your hand. 
like we're having all kinds of, of different implications. And, you know, we talk about wet bulb temperatures where people can't sweat and throw off heat, but also just the raw heat itself. When you're hitting 45, 50 degrees, you just can't survive those sort of conditions, no matter what the humidity is, even if it's really low, not for extended periods of time. So, so all of these things are happening and air conditioning is not becoming a luxury or a nice thing to have. It's becoming absolutely essential to survival in places that reach these sorts yeah. of temperatures. And, th and they, of course, rely on a very rickety old power grid. So this is where we're, we're heading. I mean, I love Kim Stanley Robinson's book, Ministry for the Future. I mean, it opens with a power grid failure in India and uh, millions of people perishing in massive heat waves. He kind of and this may to... happen in Florida or Texas or Italy yeah. or Greece. Yeah, or you know, 23 Europe. cities in Italy are under red alerts. That means everybody is told yeah. to stay out of the sun between 11 o'clock in the morning and 6 o'clock at night. Not just yeah. elderly, not just children, everybody throughout the country. <laughs> I yeah, mean, I mean, basically, the, uh, the Sahara Desert has uh, breached the Mediterranean. Um, it's heading head, head northward into southern Europe and temperatures in southern Europe, even uh, in some places in northern Europe, are temperatures that you would expect in a desert. The dryness, the temperatures you would expect in the Sahara Desert. Mediterranean reaches those sort of temperatures. There's evap lots of evaporation, you get lots of water vapor in the air. So the heat in southern Europe, although it's like the, the desert crossing, it's different in that the humidity is much, much higher than the desert because mm -hmm. you've got the source of, of for water vapor in the air. So you get this incredibly high heat and high humidity, and you're going to get wet bulb fatalities widespread. It, it's, it's a very nonlinear process. It's like people can start, stay alive, and then suddenly they're not. Suddenly they're, all, they're dead when you surpass those mm -hmm. limits of, of what the human body can tolerate. So this is what we're looking for, looking at in, in, in Europe. And what happens when temperature is half a degree or three quarters of a degree warmer in two decades, decade or two? If things are that bad now, how will that happen? Uh, what will happen then? So, so we're, we're, our backs are against the wall. And uh, th this is what the physics is saying will happen to our planet. I mean, that's just the, 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 the reality of the situation. So what are we going to do about it? If we well, reacted in a sane and, and reasonable manner, um, what we would be doing right now is we would be throwing all of the resources, money, materials, technologies, uh, labor, at this problem, right, at the climate change emergency, um, and not spending those resources on killing each other in the middle of Europe. Um, uh, yeah, there's yeah. nothing that makes our situation with um, catastrophic, climate change in our very faces um, more absurd or insane, and I have other stronger words for it, than doing nothing and spending, um, uh, um, I think we're looking at $250 billion on making war in the middle of Europe. Uh, unfortunately, um, there's no way, realistically that anything's going to be done about the climate change all the time that bloody war continues i mean obviously right and our political leaders are upping the hostility between the united states europe russia and china right that's complete and utter madness so that complete switch has to be made and, yeah, and um, I really appreciate Antonio Guterres's remark mm -hmm. that we have to stop the war against nature. So we have to really imagine a completely uh, different world and um, uh, uh, be visionary in a way. And we have to look to a future in which we have uh, a deep peace and cooperation and assistance and mutual aid, right, uh, between all the countries and uh, look at ourselves as one humanity and uh, and one world not nation states you know uh, nation states and they go back hundreds of years they're all produced by war in the first place so we have to transform and the ipcc has alluded to this we have to transform really everything about how we in the euro-american developed west operate because obviously we have been doing everything wrong right 
So we have to acknowledge that, right? And then start to at least um, planning, for heaven's sake, to do everything uh, right. And that means no more war, all our resources between trying our hardest to secure a livable future, as the IPCC puts it. We're kind of reaching the end of our time here. Um, our planet is in such a serious uh, position we don't really see it necessarily until it hits our doorstep, uh, but it is hitting our doorstep everywhere. And as Paul says, there's a kind of casino. You might hit you tomorrow. You might think it's okay tomorrow. But, you know, if you're taking a vacation and going somewhere lovely <laughs> to amuse yourself on a nice jet plane, and you probably are not living in reality because this is not appropriate anymore. We have to do with less. All of us have to do with less in this part of the world so that we have any chance of surviving. And I guess until we're, we're so shocked by it, you know, the world is uh, covered by water and just washes us away. You know, we may get to that point. And some people are left on the mountaintops. I don't know. Do we need to go there? Are we really going to go there? It's It's a big question. Thank you both for today's program. Uh, it's not cheerful news, of course, but you know we do our best to get the information into the, the public eye. And thank you. The climate system is breaking in front of our eyes in real time, as we see, and the reason is the continued record emissions of, of fossil fuels. If we allow global warming emissions to continue, obviously heat waves are going to be more frequent, they're going to be more intense, but they're also going to last longer. And the lasting longer, of course, makes a huge difference to uh, people's tolerance and health and whether people die or not. I mean, we've got a lot of idiots in, in charge of, of policy, basically. We haven't addressed the, the climate issue and we're suffering enormous consequences now. So it's fantasy to expect that things won't get a lot worse before they get better.